Okay, thank you, Steve, for inviting me. First of all, uh, I should have been slightly more intimate context for this. Uh, okay, but uh, uh, regarding the topic which I will address, uh, I found that slides are often a distraction, so I will do this in a medieval way sticking to a different manuscript. Um, you can uh, find out whatever you want about me. I, uh, I almost said uh, by using the internet, so I don't uh, take up any time saying something more about myself. But let me say that I've been studying and write, writing, talking about the dystopian side of technological progress for so long that eventually I got tired of it. So on the, I began researching what might be called the thought forms involved in utopian, dystopian, or positive, negative debates regarding especially the impact of digital technologies. The objective developments in this area are clear enough and often not very reassuring, to say the least, which former speakers here have elaborated on quite effectively. But they are at least, uh, the objective developments are at least spoken about and debated. The subjective, really personal side of it all, however, seems to me to have been less clearly articulated or even brought it before, forcefully enough. So, what might happen if we, in this larger tech, largely technical context, really put ourselves, as human beings, to the forefront? This has come to occupy me more and more, and hence the title of this talk, One Person's Utopia is Another's Dystopia the subjective dimension of objective changes. Let's start with two examples of what might be soon be or become objective changes. Recently, uh, the OECD issued a document entitled PISA 2015 Draft Collaborative Problem Solving Framework. PISA, if you don't know it, stands for the Program for International Student Assessment. PISA has come to the conclusion that collaboration might be a good thing. But how do you assess that? It's difficult to control the parameters involved in collaborative situations sufficiently in order to be able to assess it in a way that makes the results comparable across different years countries. So what, what you do, I quote from this document, it has therefore been decided to place each individual student in a collaborative problem-solving situation where the team members with whom the student has to collaborate, collaborate is fully controlled. This is achieved by programming computer agents. The document is quite clear as to the reason for this artificiality in the assessment of cooperation. Quote, when humans collaborate together, it often takes considerable time for making introductions, discussing task properties, and assigning roles during initial phases of CPS activities. CPS is collaborative problem solving and also for monitoring and checking up on team members during action cases. You can't help but get the feeling that this document must have been authored by a program for artificial agent. Another example of coming changes. In September, two researchers at Oxford University published a paper called The Future of Employment, How Susceptible our jobs to computerization. In their estimate, which uh, is based on a quite uh, 
complex model, uh, about 47% of total U.S. employment is at risk from being taken over by computers. I quote again, our model predicts that most workers in transportation and logistics occupations, together with the bulk of office and administrative support workers and labor in production occupations, are at risk. A substantial share of employment in service occupations are highly susceptible to computerization. And furthermore, computerization will principally be, quote, confined to low-skill and low-wage occupations. As technology races ahead, low-skill workers will reallocate to tasks that are non-susceptible to computerization, that is, tasks requiring creative and social intelligence. For workers to win the race, they will have to acquire creative and social skills, unquote. Uh, this, uh, by the way, is in contrast to the earlier phase of uh, industrialization where it was um, highly qualified work that was replaced by machines, like um, various kinds of, of complex handicraft being uh, done by machines instead. Now the trend is rather that low, that low skill work will be replaced. So, uh, here in these two examples, we have on the one hand a scenario in which cooperative capabilities of students are to be assessed by means of cooperation with computer programs. Because ordinary human cooperation is too messy to assess in a standardized fashion. And on the other hand, we have a scenario in which the only jobs left to humans are the ones demanding creative and social skills. Uh, to me, this indicates two different trajectories along which what might be called ubiquitous computerization are heading. One trajectory means that human beings are measured and assessed according to standards that are amenable to machine learning and machine intelligence. The tendency here is to disregard all the messy, all too human traits of which we at heart are so fond. My friend and colleague or in lover. So the possible consequences of this trajectory seem to be clearly dystopian, speaking now as a human being. But from the perspective of the OECD, bureaucracy is equally clearly utopian. It in a positive sense, it gets us closer to the ideal state of affairs where students, as well as the educational systems of different countries, can be compared quite mechanically and efficiently. It will certainly be cheaper than any all too human and because of that incomparable alternative kinds of assessment. <laughs> the other trajectory in which the only jobs left to human beings or those requiring creative and social skills and intelligence is less clearly dystopian. It could be argued that it might be a good thing. Think of all the more or less boring and routine jobs that won't bore anyone anymore because machines never get bored, do they? On the other hand, we could note the wording at the end of the report on the future of employment. For workers to win the race, they will have to acquire creative and social skills. There's a race going on between humans and machines, or jobs, this report indicates. Now, speaking of trajectories, of trends, the question arises, how relentless, how deterministic are they? This, I think, is in a way the crux of the matter, both theoretically and practically. If you ask Ray Kurzweil, Google's Director of Engineering, he will speak of the singularity, which I'm sure is not a 
the concept came from here. A state of affairs in which the capabilities of technology far outstrip the capabilities of technologically non-augmented humans. We won't even be able to enter the race without more or less merging with our technological creations, which will start to evolve independently of us if they haven't already begun to do so. This latter view of autonomous technology is espoused by Kevin Kelly in his book, What Technology Wants. <clears throat> and he calls the emerging result, results of uh, autonomous technological evolution, the technium. Um, I think there are solid reasons to think that Kurzweil's singularity scenario, based on an, ex an exponential growth of machine intelligence, as well as Kelly's evolutionarily deterministic technium, are really nothing more than fairy tales. I don't really mean that in a disparaging way. Uh, the singularity and the technium or mythological conceptions, which is important, but they are emphatically not science. The singularity in particular is now almost becoming a household world among educated parts of the public. It catches on because it ties in so well with, with the the kind of science fiction futures that have been promised for well over a hundred years by now. And now, at last, science and technology seem to be catching up with fiction. Uh, one of the clear signs that the singularity is a myth is that it's very inspiring. <laughs> and that's what real myths are for. And the thing with inspiration is that it can be exhilarating as well as terrifying. And sometimes it's the terror that exhilarates. And these mythologically induced emotions, exhilaration and terror, constitute the life breath of both utopias and dystopias. Which is to say that they're not very intellectual or even, I fear, very intelligent. Uh, intelligence now is a very tricky concept. And I think it means rather different things for human beings and for machines. I also think that we are subject here to a kind of collective illusion, which says that rationality, logical arguments, efficient and preferably cheap, Procedures are the essence of the epitome of intelligence. And I think that this is a very serious mistake, a very dangerous illusion indeed. But it can be difficult to really grasp this unless one manages to get a very much, or one manages to get very much closer to our everyday lives when thinking about it. But let us stay with the log big picture a little bit further. Recently, I've noticed that many more people who are professional technologists in the digital industries are becoming critical towards some of the possibilities inherent in the increasing technologization of society. I recall, for example, a long conversation I had with an uh, information security consultant who also has ties to the Swedish intelligence services. And his view of the future, privately, was extremely dystopian. Even to me, shockingly dystopian. I almost felt like I was talking to the Unabomber himself. Anyone here who hasn't heard of the Unabomber? 
Unfortunately, <laughs> right. there are forces working incessantly to undermine it on all fronts. Um, yesterday, as part of my job as a consultant in very, on various matters, I talked with some junior high school teachers about the impact of the new mandatory curriculum for all Swedish elementary schools. It's called in Swedish LG Elva, the Lauren Grund School. Um, an over overarching demand in LG Elva is so called entrepreneurial learning. And this is a concept uh, that has been have been uh, spreading like wildfire to uh, educational institutions in all, all developed countries uh, in the last years. Uh, and initially, I myself uh, was quite skeptical uh, about the concept and about, uh, because I know uh, what happens to entrepreneurs in real life, more often than not. Uh, I think some of the some of the speaker here referred to that. Uh, well, uh, but never mind the word. There's a real substance to substance to it when it is put to the forefront of the, the mandatory curriculum for elementary schools, because what it stresses as demands on teachers on schools is that they must. Um, emphasize creativity, curiosity, self-confidence, the will to try out your own ideas, etc. And this clearly goes against the grain of traditional industrial society school curricula and thus against the grain of the very industrial society that has fostered the aforementioned illusionary mania of narrow rationality. And uh, I found it quite inspiring to hear those teachers speak of the sometimes amazing changes pupils went through when they suddenly realized that their own interests, their own experiences, their own ideas mattered to the teacher. It was like flipping a coin. There were suddenly many of them uh, in, in the, these teachers' experiences became, became like different people, and the problem wasn't really the students, but the other teachers, uh, more often than not. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, this was at a school where every student and every teacher uh, had their own laptop, which was put to good use, and so it certainly helped. Uh, so this is, was a context in which technology, I would venture, really serve, has the potential, I should say, because there are problems with it, has the potential to serve human aims. But what really stuck in my mind was a question put by the school's headmaster, a question which was evidently of some concern. She said, but how do we measure the progress we have noticed with entrepreneurial learning. It was clear from what they said that the positive learning changes they had noticed could really be noticed only by themselves on the basis of their personal knowledge and experience. And that is how it should be. Fuck those collaborative new agent programs, uh, which the OECD is trying to implement. Uh, and clearly this will mess things up for the PISA mentality. Well, good readings then. Um, these kids will have a hard time accepting unnecessary formal and mechanical structures as they grow older. They don't know it yet. They don't know yet what they're really up against, but nothing in life, nothing in a life worth living is easy, is it? And as long as there are individual human beings who can stand up and say, 
with actor Patrick McGowan in the 60s TV series The Prisoner, I am not a number, I am a free man. I, for one, refuse to believe in neither utopias nor dystopias, because what is wrong with those conception, conceptions is that they, they tend to put us, our thinking, our very lives, our emotions, in sort of deterministic mode. So be, be conscious of that. Work against that in yourself. And I think there is hope, of, after all, despite all the clearly worrying things that are in progress. Uh, uh, that's what I had planned to say. It's time to, for comments, questions, discussion. kind of a, a, a double situation because, because on the one hand there are uh, significant demands as to knowledge, what you should, should learn, what you should know. But on the other hand, how you learn this is changing rapidly now in school schools. Uh, and uh, uh, when, uh, when talking with, with kids uh, at the age of say 10 to 15, they, they, they don't, they really don't, many of them, many more than I think uh, most people realize who don't meet these kids, who have kids on their own, uh, many more of them are really not into the consumer mentality. And schools are now starting to, to uh, reinforce that. This is kind of a, a sort of messy, hopeful development. But of course, like, like, like any, 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 uh, any, it can be uh, obstructed in various, more or less subtle ways. This, this too. There's no panacea, there's no determinism, positive determinism here either. But, but more and more, more and more young people are, are, are thinking more for themselves, taking a stand more for themselves as persons than when I was a kid at school. Very, very big difference.
opportunity for us to actually have all the people in the world not, not needing to work because it's industry automatization that is doing for us this. And there was an example, uh, the Telex company, I don't know if you know about that, in the USA, uh, un for like 40 years or something, they have been operating uh, in a way that was completely contrary to the capitalistic uh, industrialization setup that we have. Instead of increasing their profits, they said, we decrease the working time of our workers. And in the end, they had like only four hour working day in their society, in the whole city where the Kellogg's company was based. And in this city, there was no need for public services, for policy, uh, for, for anything like that, because the people themselves had the time to take care of their city. And it was a beautiful city without any kind of centralized government or, or whatever, because the people themselves had the time to, because they, they, the time was bought for them from, from industrialization. And this has been put back into society as a, as a, as a gross benefit. Uh, and this has, has been lasting for like 40 years, but pressure from outside was so great that I think in 86 or something, uh, this model that was working for 40 years has been um, uh, reverted and they now do the same capitalistic shit as everyone else. Too bad. But this is a model that I think uh, is actually a, a positive model, a, a utopia. But it well, existed already. In what, what your example with the gun says is that uh, technology, what technology really does is to reinforce and augment our, our capabilities. And, and which the more, the more powerful our technologies get, the more powerful the demands on us as human beings, as thinking persons, become. And that, I think, is the real, real difficulty, the real challenge here. Because uh, you, uh, you have to educate for that, for both informally, like, like in this kind of context, and, and, and formally. You have to really say that we will, from now on, put human beings at center stage. We will not allow ourselves to be dominated by our own creations. Because that is what happens when you, when you for example, think that uh, machine, a manual intelligence is, is, is the epitome of intelligence. Yes, uh, my question was about to return to the school and to the classroom. Yeah. And I'm involved in um, the project Art for Children in Net. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, um, some of our associated um, uh, people, they were studying um, the classroom where all the children got iPads at um, the start of the school year. And what happened in this kind of consumption and creativity thing was that uh, they had great fun with all the free apps. And then, of course, with the consumption uh, concept, they had to pay. And it was no money in the school for paying. And then my suggestion was, why don't they try some of those uh, kids programming thing like scratch or sugar on a stick. But apparently you can't use any of those things on those tablets. So <laughs> what about the creativity in the classroom? So in a way you are locked in at this consumption. That's one reason why why I'm not myself a great fan of my child. I'm 
responsibility. What do they want? 